Well, good morning and welcome to the Wilson Centre. We are very pleased today to be able to welcome the 28th Prime Minister of Australia, Tony Abbott, who has been a longtime advocate for strong US-Australia partnership. He served as Prime Minister from 2013 until 2015, uh, which also corresponded with the beginning of the Xi Jinping era in China. Uh, he, Tony Abbott was Prime Minister in the build-up, uh, during a period of build-up in Australia's economic relationship with China, which actually included Australia's becoming a founding member of the Asian Infrastructure mm -hmm. Investment Bank. Uh, but his views of China have changed in the intervening years, as have those of so many others during the same period. He laid out the reasons uh, for his growing concern with Chinese power recently in an October 8th speech at the Yushan Forum in Taipei, which was widely covered worldwide uh, and which certainly got the attention of Beijing. Uh, the Chinese embassy in Canberra actually said, uh, his recent despicable and insane performance in Taiwan fully exposed his hideous anti-China features. I think your features look okay to me, uh, but <laughs> hideous and uh, despicable and insane. I think actually that's only the second strongest insult I've heard them issue to a Western leader. The stronger was to Chris Patton when he was the governor general of Hong Kong and China called him the whore of history. Uh, <laughs> but I think that you did uh, fairly well with despicable and insane. Following his trip to Taiwan, uh, the Prime Minister has been here in Washington for a series of consultations, and we've asked him to join us this morning to give a readout of features of your trip to Taiwan, but also some of the conversations that you've been having here in Washington. Uh, we also hope maybe you'll offer your views on developments in the Indo-Pacific mm -hmm. as well. After the Prime Minister's remarks, uh, we'll go to Abe Denmark, who will offer his thoughts on these issues, and we'll also have some questions, after which we will welcome questions uh, from you in the audience. Uh, if you would like to ask a question, please send an email to china at wilsoncenter.org. That's china at wilsoncenter, one word, dot org. I say, and then we'll have discussions from Abe, who is the Wilson Center's Vice President for Programs and the former Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense during the Obama administration. And he has long uh, and broad experience in the Indo-Pacific. So we look forward to a discussion between the two of you. Uh, so with that, welcome, Mr. Prime Minister, and please tell us uh, what you heard and what you said in Taiwan and here in DC. Well, Robert, thank you. It's wonderful to be with you and Abe here at the Wilson Center. Um, like everyone, uh, until probably uh, the end of 2015, I was a China optimist. We all thought uh, for a long time that China and the West were on if you like, converging paths. Maybe the convergence was a long way off, but we all thought that over time, uh, a more liberal Chinese economy would inevitably produce a more liberal Chinese society and ultimately a more liberal Chinese polity. Uh, what we've discovered though, is that uh, uh, instead of getting better, things have slowly got worse. Uh, indeed, they've started to rapidly get worse uh, in more recent times under Xi Jinping. We've had the suppression of the Uyghurs. We've had the development of the social credit system within China. We've had the crushing of Hong Kong. We've had the bullying of neighbors. We've had the militarization of the South China Sea. And most recently, we've had this extreme and increasing belligerence towards Taiwan. Now, uh, a couple of years back, I was invited to address the Yushan Forum. And at that stage, I was a bit reluctant to call out China uh, from Taipei. I didn't particularly want to be uh, provocative in inverted commas and I didn't want to be accused of making Australia's relations with China our biggest customer worse. Uh, so I didn't go then but since then not only has China's behaviour uh, deteriorated further uh, but China has uh, weaponized trade against Australia. About 20 billion dollars worth of Australian trade has been capriciously interrupted on bogus safety grounds uh, by China. So I figured that uh, now was absolutely the right time to go to Taiwan, which has become the front line of freedom, and make a speech which showed solidarity with this democracy of 25 million people, a liberal, pluralist democracy, which over the last four decades has moved from an impoverished dictatorship uh, into uh, a nation that really is a, a certainly a place and a people that really is a beacon of hope uh, to the wider world, a sign that there is no totalitarian gene in the Chinese DNA. So I thought it was very important 
uh, to engage in that exercise of solidarity with Taiwan. I think it's important for democracies ever, uh, everywhere to uh, do what they can to show solidarity with uh, Taiwan at this time. And certainly one way of showing sol solidarity with Taiwan at this time would be to admit Taiwan into the Trans-Pacific Partnership. It's applied to join. Uh, it is a free and a fair trader. Uh, it uh, accepts the ordinary rules of commerce, uh, the sanctity of contract, etc. Uh, it's prepared to operate under the Trans-Pacific Partnership rules, so let's have Taiwan in. Now, as I say, uh, Taiwan is the front line of freedom. Um, China is uh, stepping up its intimidation of Taiwan all the time. Uh, in the few days before my visit, there were something like 150 Chinese warplanes dispatched into the Taiwanese uh, air zones. Uh, I expect that this will get uh, more intense. I expect that uh, this kind of thing will move closer to Taiwan itself. And the big challenge for the democracies uh, is what do we do in response? Now, I think we need to be prepared to think the unthinkable. Uh, I think it's entirely possible um, that at some point in time, perhaps quite soon, uh, China might uh, up the ante either with a blockade of the so-called uh, rebel province uh, to uh, teach the Taiwanese that they cannot go on as they are. They need to make some kind of a, an accommodation with Beijing or perhaps even uh, a full-scale invasion. Uh, I think it's that serious and I don't think it is safe to assume that this might not happen for, for, for years or decades. So I think it is important uh, for people in countries like the United States, Japan, Australia, uh, for democracies everywhere uh, to be thinking, what is our response? What is our military response? What is our economic response uh, in the event of an escalation of hostilities by China uh, against, uh, against Taiwan? Uh, now, I've been obviously talking about these issues uh, here in, uh, in Washington and elsewhere in the United States. I've also been talking about the recent AUKUS uh, arrangements, which were announced by President Biden, Prime Minister Boris Johnson, and our Prime Minister Scott Morrison about a month ago. At the moment, um, the centrepiece of the AUKUS arrangement is the acquisition by Australia uh, of a nuclear-powered submarine in cooperation with uh, Britain and the United States. Now, I think this is a very significant decision by Australia probably the biggest decision that any Australian government has made in decades. But as things stand, we are not going to acquire uh, an actual operational nuclear submarine, uh, perhaps for two decades. And we need uh, more and better submarines now. We have a small but effective uh, uh, Collins class uh, uh, fleet of uh, submarines. Uh, we need better, bigger, faster, more wide-ranging submarines, not in two, two decades' time, uh, but now. So one of the issues that I've been informally discussing uh, here in Washington and elsewhere in the United States is, might it be possible for Australia to acquire a retiring LA-class boat or two, uh, to put it under an Australian flag, uh, to run it, if you like, as an operational training boat, uh, but it would, uh, in that capacity, be if you like, an addition to the order of battle in the Western Pacific, uh, should that be necessary. Now, these are just informal discussions, uh, but nevertheless, I think it is important to socialise these ideas with people in Washington. And uh, were I in London, I would be doing the same thing there, because as I say, uh, the challenges are, uh, are pressing. Uh, the peril is not far off. Um, it is important uh, to be conscious uh, of, of what could happen quite soon and be ready to deal with it. So, Robert, uh, uh, that's my report, if you like. Uh, thank you for having me, and I look forward to the discussion. Well, thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm going to go to Abe Denmark in just a minute. But first, if you have questions, again, please send them to us at china at wilsoncenter.org, uh, and we will read them out. Uh, Abe, over to you. Uh, 
Thank you, Robert, and thank you very much uh, for, for coming to the Wilson Center. Um, I thought your, your uh, speech in Taiwan was um, very, very interesting and very helpful in terms of identifying some of the key issues. Um, one of the pieces that struck me was um, when you said that if there are drums of war beating in uh, the Indo-Pacific, the beating is coming from China, which mm -hmm. I think is very important. Mm -hmm. um, one of the, I think, key questions that all of us who watch China, who are impacted by China, have been uh, thinking about trying to understand um, has been what is behind uh, China's more assertive behavior in, in, uh, that we've seen over in the recent years. Um, we've heard a lot of different um, explanations for it. I can uh, tell you, uh, give you what I think, but I'm interested in what you think as well. Um, in terms of what's driving their behavior, to me there's clearly a domestic political uh, piece of it, um, with Xi Jinping trying to set the stage for his uh, what some call re-election, re I call reselection, um, to a, a third and probably lifetime appointment as general secretary of the Chinese mm -hmm. Communist Party and trying to use that tension to drive people to rally around the flag. Uh, but in addition to that, I think they, that Xi and the others in leadership in China see China as increasingly powerful, see the United States as both embroiled in a competition with, with China, but also as a declining power. Um, that the competition is not only economic and military, but it's fundamentally over ideology and the, our systems, um, and that time is on their side, that the trends, the broad ge geopolitical trends are in China's favor, um, and that eventually the region will, uh, they expect the region will eventually um, recognize the trends of history and acknowledge uh, Chinese uh, leadership and hegemony. Uh, but I'd be interested in, in your thoughts on that. Um, the other pieces that, that you mentioned that um, I think are, are important, I'd be interested in your thoughts on there. Um, in terms of Taiwan's importance, um, you, you talked, uh, you, you had some very strong language, you had some very strong arguments about the need for solidarity with Taiwan. Uh, with us today, you talked a lot about Taiwan's importance as a democracy, mm -hmm. a robust e uh, economic power. Um, the other piece that I would add in terms of why we th I think Taiwan is important is, is its geography. Mm -hmm. um, that it is the largest landmass between Japan and the Philippines. And if Beijing were to be able to control uh, Taiwan, it would, be, it would have a, an open window to exert more power in the Western Pacific, but also to cut Japan off from the rest of uh, the rest of the world, um, a situation they haven't had since the end of the war. Um, which would be uh, very significant for Australia's interest, for our, in for the United States' interest, and of course, problematic for Japan. Um, the, I, I really appreciate your your statement on AUKUS mm -hmm. um, and why that's important. I think it's part of a, a broader trend um, that of the United States continuing to shift its focus towards the Indo-Pacific. And just recently, in a, about a six-week period of time. We saw the United States withdraw from Afghanistan after nearly 20 years. Uh, we saw them host the first in-person uh, summit of the Quad, mm -hmm. um, and then the AUKUS agreement, which is a pretty profound shift. Um, and I'd be curious your thoughts on the role that Japan can play, uh, the role that India can play um, in both the Indo-Pacific, but also in terms of competition with China. Um, and the last piece I wanted to, to um, get your thoughts on, if I may, and um, I'll, I'll be happy to summarize these if you want. I know I'm <laughs> piling on a bit. Um, the alliance, the U.S.-Australia alliance, um, which you've been a very strong supporter of um, throughout your career. Um, you mentioned the provisioning of uh, Los Angeles-class submarines, uh, which I think is a very interesting idea. There's some... Uh, logistical pieces to that, training pieces to that, that we'd, that, uh, we'd have to figure out. But um, I'd also be interested in your thoughts on how the U.S. and Australia can continue to evolve our military posture in the region. We had the agreement with, in Darwin of a rotational presence of Marines, um, but there's also been some scholars have expressed interest in enhancing U.S. Uh, military access to some of the Australian facilities on the West Coast, um, some of access to some of the islands that Australia um, has in close to the South China Sea. Um, I'd be curious your thoughts on how the alliance can evolve um, 
Okay. Broadly speaking. Thank you, Abe. So the alliance, uh, AUKUS and Xi Jinping. Yeah. Um, first of all, the alliance. Well, look, um, <laughs> uh, American and Australian troops first went into battle together at Le Hamel yeah. on the 4th of July, 1918. And Australia has been with the United States in every single one of its conflicts uh, ever since. Not even Britain has quite the same record of solidarity with the United States that Australia has. And one of the points that I made uh, as Prime Minister in Washington back in 2014 was that America may have more important allies, uh, it may have more uh, stronger allies, uh, but it will never have a more dependable ally than the United States. And I said that because back then uh, President Obama had said that America couldn't be the world's policeman on its own understand after bearing the burdens of freedom and democracy and uh, the global order for 70 years you could understand why that was the feeling in America and it seemed to become even more entrenched uh, under under President Trump uh, yet the world does need uh, if you like a policeman and the only country with the strength and the benevolence for that role is in fact the United States in that sense the United States remains the indispensable nation and if it is necessary uh, for the United States uh, to act with partners, Australia will be there. I think you can be confident that Australia will be there. And uh, yes, uh, we'd like to see uh, a bigger marine presence in Darwin. Uh, we've just announced, I think, a billion dollars worth of upgrading to uh, naval uh, port facilities in Perth. Uh, which obviously will help with the, the AUKUS arrangements uh, and so on. Um, AUKUS, look, uh, I think it's terrific that the United Kingdom is once more taking an active role in the Far East. It was good to see the HMS Queen Elizabeth Carrier Strike Group uh, deployed to the Western Pacific recently. I think Britain wants to uh, rotate it and its other new carrier uh, through uh, the Western Pacific uh, uh, quite uh, quite regularly and obviously the more of the Western democracies are taking an interest in this part of the world the better given its uh, strategic significance. Uh, finally Xi Jinping, look um, I had some considerable dealings with Xi Jinping uh, as Prime Minister. Um, Xi Jinping declared in the English version of his speech to the Australian Parliament at the end of 2014 that China would be, quote, fully democratic by mid-century. What he meant by fully democratic, what we would understand by fully democratic, were probably two different things. But the fact that he chose to say that in the English version of his speech in the Australian Parliament, I thought was surely significant. But I think in retrospect, that marked the high water point mm. Uh, of of uh, the now gone period of Chinese liberalisation and if you like integration into uh, a more peaceful um, and ordered world. Um, it's been uh, full steam re in reverse if you like, full, full ahead astern as it were uh, ever since then. Look, uh, Xi Jinping says that it is absolutely necessary uh, for Taiwan to be uh, taken back into the uh, in, in, into China, uh, he says that it's absolutely necessary that by 2049, uh, the centenary of the communist takeover, that China be the world's number one power. And I think when dictators speak plainly, we have to take them seriously. Um, I think he means what he says. Uh, and that's why I think we have to be absolutely ready uh, for a continued escalation of pressure on Taiwan up to and including a full-scale military assault. I think that's, that's, very, that's very helpful. And you know, there's a, one of the questions that we've been asking ourselves that in, in privately and at times publicly, um, in Washington, as we think about this, is um, if China will actually use force against Taiwan soon. Uh, you seem to think that it's, there's a, a good probability of it. Um, others, um, uh, American officials, former military officials, have said that there's a good probability 
um, in the next few years um, at a time when China's capabilities are really coming online, but before the U.S. Uh, capabilities are able to, to uh, catch up. Um, yet others think that uh, Xi Jinping will want to keep the, the water hot but not boil over. Um, since it's such a big risk for him to use um, force. I'm curious he, what your thoughts on that. He's shown an appetite for risk-taking. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I mean, he, he, he was obviously taking some risks when he abrogated the uh, One Country, Two Systems Treaty over Hong Kong, but there's been virtually no pushback, um, not even Magnitsky-style sanctions on senior Chinese officials. So. I think he's, uh, he, he feels he's pushing on an open door. Uh, that's why I think the risk to Taiwan is heightened. Mm. Um, obviously, Taiwan is a very different uh, situation from Hong Kong. I mean, there's the 100 miles of water uh, to be traversed. Taiwan does have uh, significant armed forces. Uh, I think the mood of the Taiwanese people is definitely uh, to resist uh, any attempt to be incorporated into communist China. I mean, why would you surrender uh, your prosperity and your freedom? Um, why would you? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, um, it is a, a David and Goliath struggle, and you could understand why, uh, in the absence of support from others, uh, the Taiwanese might regard it as uh, an unequal and ultimately hopeless struggle. And that's why I think it's important uh, for Taiwan's fellow democracies uh, to provide all the solidarity mm. that we can. You were saying earlier that uh, Taiwan is not just a democracy, it's also a very strategically important uh, island. Um, it's, if you like, the key to the first island chain. Mm. Um, it would, uh, Japan would be dangerously exposed uh, if Taiwan were to go into Chinese hands. And I think that's why uh, Japanese leaders have been saying recently that any attack on Taiwan would effectively be an attack on Taiwan itself. I think that's a very, a very considerable statement by the Japanese, and I am sure that the Chinese would be taking this seriously. But but the, the Chinese need to know that any move on Taiwan would have the most grave consequences, uh, because if they thought that it could be lightly undertaken, I have little doubt that they, that they would do it. Now, it's not just strategically significant, it's economically significant. I mean, yeah. something like 70% of our semiconductors, um, which are the keys to so much these days, uh, come out of Taiwan. So, so, so I, kn I know the world has a lot on its plate at the moment. Um, uh, the Middle East is still a very dangerous place. Uh, there's... Uh, Vladimir Putin's uh, designs on uh, countries that were formerly part of the Soviet Union. Um, there's the ongoing difficulties with the pandemic. Um, there's climate change. There's all sorts of things happening uh, at the moment. But, but we, we cannot allow ourselves uh, to miss what is going on uh, between China and its neighbours the Chinese naval build-up is stupendous, absolutely stupendous. And you say, Abe, uh, uh, um, China wants to increase its capabilities. Um, its capabilities are already yeah. enormous. Now, you also say um, the US um, is, is, is responding. Well, um, is the US increasing its capabilities at the same rate as China is? Mm. I think the short answer is no. Uh, I think the gap uh, is likely to get wider, not smaller, uh, in the years to come. And, and this, is a, this is a daunting situation to be in. I suppose there's, there's two things that give me hope. Uh, the first is that um, if you're a rich Chinese, uh, you can't wait to get your assets out of the country and you can't wait uh, to get uh, your kids a Western passport. I mean, that's why Chinese students uh, uh, flock to America, Canada, Britain, uh, Australia, etc. Um, the other thing, of course, is that notwithstanding all the self-flagellation which is going on at the moment uh, in countries like uh, America, Britain and Australia over our alleged 
um, racism, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, millions of people can't wait to get here. Mm. Uh, millions of people from uh, the countries that we have supposedly victimised over the years can't wait to cross the English Channel. They can't wait to cross the Rio Grande. They can't wait to get on a boat to come to Australia. Um, these countries, now so racked with self-doubt and division, are still the inspiration to tens of millions of people all over the world. They are still the countries that people want to live in if they have half a chance. And that, I suppose, is uh, the one gleam of optimism just now, uh, given China's rapidly growing military strength uh, and the fact that it's sustained now by an extraordinarily sophisticated economy. Yeah. Um, that brings me, the last question I want to ask before I turn things to Robert, who I guess has questions from, mm. from uh, the audience. Um, you've been meeting with Americans mm -hmm. here. You're uh, uh, clearly a, a, a deep thinker about the dynamics of the Indo-Pacific. What would you look for from the United States in response to all of this? Well, I, I was very encouraged to hear President Biden say uh, just the other day that uh, America uh, would come to Taiwan's aid if it were attacked. And other members of the administration have been uh, uh, reiterating that America's commitment to Taiwan is rock solid. Uh, the various international gatherings, the G7, the uh, OSMIN, um, um, communique, etc., have all talked about Taiwan being a critical partner mm -hmm. and a key democracy. And this is an important rhetorical escalation within the settled policy, if you like. Yeah. Uh, to be honest, uh, apart from um, making sure that <laughs> the wind down of the Navy is reversed <laughs> and the Navy is, is built back up, I think the best thing that the United States could do is join the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Mm. It was, if you like, an American idea. It was the economic arm of the tilt to the Indo-Pacific, which President Obama made so much of in a wonderful speech to the Australian Parliament back in uh, 2011. Unfortunately, having proclaimed the tilt to the Pacific, having announced with great fanfare the Trans-Pacific Partnership, America then decided to opt out. It was a withdrawal <laughs> in its own way, no less significant than the failure to join the League of Nations, uh, mm. having, in a sense, promoted the thing, having given birth almost to the thing. And I suppose we should mention this at the Wilson Center, shouldn't we? How Absolutely. fitting. Absolutely. So please, uh, I mean, Joe Biden was a part, a senior part of the Obama administration. Maybe this is a part of the Obama legacy that he could well and truly carry through and come back into the TPP. I agree with you there. Go ahead, Robert. Could you, before we go to audience questions, mm. could you give us a feel for the range of opinion and the depth of opinion in Australia about China uh, and about AUKUS? You know, as you mentioned, it could be 2040 before the first nuclear power submarines are available. 20 years, going to be a lot of water under a lot of bridges. China's going to change. Think of China 20 years ago and where we are now. And it seems to have been, you know, reading your Yushan speech and, and you know, keeping track of Australia and Chinese relations, it was especially China's economic coercion mm -hmm. of Australia, the, the cutting off of vital Australian exports mm -hmm. to China, this issuance of, you know, 14 demands really for capitulation to Australia uh, that seemed to have hardened a lot of Australian attitudes in the run up to the AUKUS announcement. Mm -hmm. But of course, that's somewhat reversible. China could turn on the taps, mm -hmm. if it so chose, to remind Australians of uh, all that China can provide economically. And I've read of, you know, there's some Australians who, who've dissented from, from AUKUS. Could you give us a sense for how deep, how broad uh, a commitment to, you know, standing up to China is, even if, if the economic taps were turned back on? And could you tell us a little bit about the diversity of opinion. What do Australians say who are nervous mm. about the AUKUS arrangement? Robert, just on AUKUS, I mean, there's really two, two projects here. Mm. Uh, now that we've made the commitment to get a nuclear powered submarine, uh, there's, there's project number one, which is to get either the Virginia class or the Astute class, uh, preferably built in Australia as soon as we can, but 
as we've discussed, that may well be two decades hence. And then there's, frankly, a second project, and that's to get our hands on a nuclear-powered submarine uh, within months rather than decades. And the obvious possibilities are to take over some retiring LA-class submarines in the, or, or submarines currently in the reserve fleet, or indeed the two Trafalgar-class uh, submarines that will be retiring from the Royal Navy in the next 12 months or so. So there's, there's essentially, uh, I, think, I think, two projects within the overall project of obtaining for the Australian Navy nuclear-powered submarines. Now, in terms of Australia's attitudes to China, uh, the Lowy Institute routinely polls our attitudes to other countries, significant other countries, and uh, as late as uh, 2015, Australian attitudes to China were strongly positive. Um, over the last few years, they've gone well and truly into reverse, and they're now extremely negative. Uh, and they're negative for a reason, uh, because of China's behaviour. I mean... The Quad is not a manifestation of countries ganging up on China. The Quad has been, in effect, created by China's bad behaviour. I mean, India is not part of the Quad uh, for any other reason than China's aggression towards India in the Himalayas. So it's, it's China's behaviour which has created the Quad, not the bad attitudes of the countries of the Quad. I think it's very important for, for that point to be, to be crystal clear. Now, we're obviously conscious of the fact that uh, uh, trade with China has been very good for our economy. And if that trade were to be drastically diminished, there would certainly be short and long-term economic consequences for Australia. But interestingly, I think China has more to lose from the cessation of trade with Australia than we do. Uh, Australian iron ore, coal and gas is critically important to daily life mm. in China. Uh, their steel production on which their building activities uh, depend, um, their heating. I mean, we, we, we know that China is currently going through a, a bit of an energy crisis, uh, which has caused it to actually unboycott some Australian coal. So, so yes, China has tried to hurt us by weaponising trade. Um, but we could do a lot of damage to China. Not that we are uh, that kind of a country. Um, but if there were, for argument's sake, uh, an attack on, on Taiwan, uh, it's hard to imagine that there wouldn't, at the very least, be an economic boycott of China, uh, at least by the democratic West. And that would obviously have ramifications uh, for China. So, so, so there are lots of people in China, in Australia, who are anxious about the economic consequences of a disruption to our trade. But I think people in China should be even more anxious, if you like. And that's why, um, as well as calling out China in Taiwan, I did try to remind the Chinese that when their behaviour was different and better, when they showed uh, appropriate respect to other countries, um, other countries responded very generously to them. Uh, I mean, when China was in its hide and bide phase, uh, which maybe all along was a, was a ruse, but when China was in its hide and bide phase, the world beat a, part, beat a path to Beijing's door. Uh, we included China in the WTO. Uh, we integrated China into, our, uh, in, into, the, into the global economy. China became part of so many supply chains. Uh, we welcomed Chinese students into our universities. Uh, we welcomed Chinese people uh, uh, to work in our countries. So, so the point I keep making is, uh, uh, countries like Australia have nothing but goodwill towards the Chinese people. What we rightly object to right now is the extraordinary bullying of the Chinese Communist government. Uh, but if, if that were to disappear, uh, provided it, it looked like there was a genuine change of heart, 
I think once more uh, the world would feel benevolent towards China. Yeah, well, thank you. We have a, a first question from uh, the Voice of America, right. China branch for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, which says, Xi Jinping seems to refuse to be in the same room with Western leaders by skipping two summits in Europe this week. Are, are you worried about that? Are you worried about his, his not coming forth? If China refuses to be in multilateral fora, how can we cooperate effectively on issues like climate change? Well, that's a very good question. And I think it's pretty clear that China is not going to cooperate on climate change. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I think uh, Western countries should be careful about turning their economies uh, uh, upside down to reduce emissions when China's almost certain uh, not to take commensurate action itself. Now, we all want to protect the planet. It's the only planet that we've got. We all want to get emissions down as far and as fast as we can. but. Uh, if uh, that means uh, unreliable and extremely expensive power, uh, if it means uh, heavy industry migrating to other countries that are less fastidious about emissions, I think we have to be extremely careful, particularly given the, the, the growing strategic competition with China. So, so I, I think it's obvious that China will never do more than pretend to play ball on climate change because for China, at least under Xi Jinping, uh, the main game is strategic domination. We have a question now from Sir John Scarlett, who is co-chair of the Wilson Center's Global Affairs Council, who asks, you refer to the roles of countries such as Japan and India. You also speak of the importance of AUKUS. Can you say more about a realistic Indo-Pacific role for the UK and the role of France? Well, both Britain and France have recently dispatched carrier groups to the Western Pacific, and I think that is uh, all to the good. And uh, I very much hope that uh, Britain will send more units of the Royal Navy more regularly uh, to, uh, to the Far East. It would be wonderful to see uh, some units of the Royal Navy uh, uh, effectively based in Singapore, the way uh, some American ships are now effectively based in Singapore. Um, we've got uh, an astute class submarine uh, visiting Australia at, at this moment, having earlier been part of the HMS Queen Elizabeth uh, task group. So, so, so I think it's, it's very important uh, for both Britain and France, which have long had a Pacific presence uh, to uh, increase that Pacific presence, given that um, East Asia is now probably uh, uh, the most strategically important part of the world. We have a question now from the South China Morning Post. There is a history of public protest and pushback with big attack submarine programs in democracies dating back to Britain in the 1950s. By some accounts, the percent of Australia's GDP spent on the military might have to rise 50% to 100% in order to finance the nuclear submarine program. Would you expect the Australian people to accept this, especially if the global and Australian economies weaken in the next decade or two? Well, that's uh, a very uh, interesting question and I suppose uh, uh, an interesting implicit observation within it. Look. Uh, I, I find it hard to believe that our economies won't all be weakened by the impact of the pandemic. I find it hard to believe that you can close businesses down for long periods of time uh, and just expect them to snap back to life uh, in the way a bear might emerge from its winter hibernation. I, I think there will be long-term damage and change coming from, from the pandemic. Nevertheless, uh, I also think that um, we accept that uh, given the, uh, this, this new era of great power competition, it is going to be important to uh, increase our, our, our preparedness and that's going to mean further military spending. Now, my government increased Australia's defence spending from about 1.5% of GDP to 2% of GDP. 
the Morrison government anticipates that it may have to increase quite substantially beyond that. I noticed the leader of the Labor Party today uh, saying that uh, Labor would be prepared, should it form a government, to increase military spending uh, beyond 2%. I think there is a general recognition in Australia that acquiring the capabilities that a serious country needs in a time like this is going to, is going to mean uh, more spending on, on defence. And yes, uh, a significant nuclear powered submarine fleet is obviously going to cost more to acquire and to run than a smaller conventional powered fleet. So your comments about expanding capabilities uh, lead well into the next question, which is about combining the efforts of various partners and various partnerships. Do you see prospects uh, with perhaps for AUKUS to be expanded? New Zealand is, is said to have some interest. Do you see any way to work with the Quad, with the Five Eyes? Uh, NATO is now uh, contemplating an, an, an Asian mission. Uh, what, what prospects, if any, do you see for expanding capabilities through enhanced cooperation? Well, I think that uh, AUKUS complements all the other partnerships that Australia has. I think it complements the Quad. I think it complements the Five Eyes. Um, the G7 is in the process of becoming, I think, the D7. So I, so I think all of these things are helpful additions to democratic solidarity uh, at a difficult and challenging time. Um, one of the other issues that uh, I've been in discussions, uh, informal discussions about here in Washington and elsewhere, has been uh, uh, enhanced intelligence sharing with Japan. I mean, Japan is a very serious country. It has great strategic weight. Uh, it is even at 1% of GDP uh, military spending, a serious uh, military power. Um, there are very honourable people, the Japanese, and uh, it would make sense to me to do everything we can to try to uh, do more with Japan in the intelligence field, uh, even to the point of trying to bring Japan in as a sixth eye, if you like, mm. into the Five Eyes arrangement. Now, uh, there may need to be some changes um, uh, for that to take place, but, but I think certainly Japan could be a very powerful addition uh, to the traditional Five Eyes partnership. Abe, a lot of ideas on the table. Do you want to weigh in? Yeah, I, th I thought, um, just reacting to what you said, I think um, thinking about the role of Japan in all of this, especially as it comes to the uh, US-Australia mm -hmm. alliance, is very important. There's a middle area between the Quad and the US-Australia, the US-Japan alliance the, um, being the, the US-Japan-Australia trilateral relationship, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, which has been overshadowed a bit by the Quad, by AUKUS mm -hmm. and all that. I'd um, be curious your thoughts on um, how Australia and Japan can work together um, or some of the areas of enhanced cooperation. Um, the other piece that you suggest that you mentioned that um, brought to my mind that I'd ap appreciate your thoughts on um, you've talked a lot about democratic solidarity, the D7, et cetera. Um, one of the areas that uh, the Wilson Center has been um, uh, leading on research on has been uh, Chinese political interference mm -hmm. um, in Australia, in New Zealand, in the United States, in, um, in Taiwan. Um, but that's a piece that doesn't get discussed as much as the economic coercion, mm -hmm. the military piece. I'd be curious your thoughts on the importance of that interference, how we can work as allies, as democracies um, to counter that, um, and the significance of Chinese um, efforts to interfere in our democracies uh, in the context of competition. Thanks, Abe. Look, just on, on Japan, Australia is constantly deepening its uh, defense and security relationship with Japan. And my understanding is that we've just come to an agreement with Japan, um, the first agreement of its type that Japan has with any country other than the United States is, is now with us, which should enable, for argument's sake, uh, uh, Japanese uh, forces to participate in the uh, biannual talisman cyber exercise uh, in, 
in Queensland, which uh, obviously sees a lot of Americans uh, and a lot of American materiel coming to Australia. So, so look, that's important and that will go on. Uh, in terms of Chinese interference, look, uh, uh, I guess we don't want to talk about it because uh, we don't want to embarrass Chinese Australians uh, mm. uh, who are uh, normally the targets of this kind of thing. Um, we've got about a million Australians of Chinese background and um, these days uh, Xi Jinping and the Communist Party seems to assume that they have a, a duty to the motherland, so to speak, that transcends their, uh, their duties as citizens of Australia. Uh, I've got to say, uh, uh, I think that Chinese Australians are much more likely to be agents for our values uh, in China than the other way round. Uh, and I think that the vast majority of Chinese Australians by all means uh, want to be, as it were, genial and friendly uh, towards uh, um, people of similar culture and, and, and linguistics, but, but, but they are determined to be loyal to Australia. I think what China is constantly trying to do is recruit them for Chinese foreign policy objectives through United Front type, uh, type organisations. And uh, that's where I suppose uh, it's important uh, for us to be vigilant, but it's also very important for us to make it absolutely crystal clear um, that uh, Chinese Australians are absolutely first class parts of Team Australia. I'm glad to hear you say that. If I could just follow up a little bit. Yeah. We have a similar problem here in the United yeah. States where mm -hmm. we've seen an increase in anti-Asian American violence, anti-Chinese American violence uh, for a number of reasons. A lot of it has been tied to arguments about COVID. A lot of it draws on uh, traditional racist strains in the United States. But I'm worried that as U.S.-China, China-Australia relations continue to decline. Mm -hmm. I think you've painted a picture of why that's going to happen. And as those of us who are in the business of describing this relationship for a living try to do our work, mm. it's going to become more and more difficult to frame the China challenge or threat accurately, to spur the kind of vigilance mm. that you describe, mm. without also contributing to these racist tensions. And you, you, you just mentioned that that has to be done, but how, how do we do that? How do we balance our legitimate security yeah. needs while absolutely you know, recognizing and protecting this essential contribution to both of our countries by people of Chinese descent. Absolutely, look, uh, I think by constantly stressing that our argument is not with the Chinese people, our argument is with the actions of the current Chinese government. And by constantly stressing that uh, everyone who is an American citizen or an Australian citizen, regardless of your race, your culture, your religion, your background is a first class Australian, is a first class American and nothing gives me more pleasure and satisfaction and pride uh, than to see uh, uh, ethnically diverse Australians all speaking literally and metaphorically with a strong Australian accent and, and that's been the glory of, of our countries. I mean we are both immigrant societies uh, we have both traditionally been melting pots, uh, so to speak. Uh, and when, when, when we refer to uh, multicultural Australia, um, what we normally mean is that uh, we welcome people from everywhere um, and we allow them uh, to become part of Australia in their own way and at their own pace. And we know that we'll be better off and they'll be better off as a result of the contribution that all of us together make to a better Australia. Can we also contribute to better relations? You've laid out, and I, and I agree with you broadly, that, that it's been Chinese actions, Chinese mm. behavior, uh, that have changed a lot of minds in Australia and all over the world. Is there anything now that Australia can do, that the United States can do, to try to lower the temperature somewhat in our relations with China, to create opportunities for dialogue, to try to lower threats, uh, in addition to pointing out you know, China's many concerning actions. Is there anything that our countries could do now in the short term 
to try to set a foundation at least for discussion of where this is going rather than you know, increased signaling on both sides? Well, that's a, a very fair question. And President Biden, as I understand it, has, has had a number of conversations with Xi Jinping. Uh, and that's to President Biden's credit. And it's good that Xi Jinping has, uh, has taken the call. Unfortunately, Chinese ministers just won't take the calls of Australian ministers, and that's been the case for a couple of years now. So, so um, what, was, what was it that Churchill said? Jaw jaw is better than war war. Mm. The Chinese don't seem to want any jaw jaw, uh, at least with Australia. Um, so we are certainly open right. to, uh, to dialogue. We would welcome dialogue. And, Wherever possible, uh, we want to be helpful. Um, for instance, when I was Prime Minister and MH370 disappeared into the wastes of the Southern Indian Ocean with about 150 Chinese people on board, uh, as well as uh, uh, 240 people overall, um, we put enormous efforts uh, into the search for that plane, the still unsuccessful search for that plane, and we welcomed... Uh, uh, Japanese, Korean and Chinese aircraft uh, uh, to our P Pierce Naval ba uh, Air Force Base near Perth, which was the centre of the search. And uh, I can remember uh, getting uh, Chinese, uh, Korean and Japanese air crews to stand together for a joint photograph. Uh, I had to physically drag them in because that's the kind of thing that they're not naturally inclined to do, but nevertheless, um, I think that the more constructive cooperation and engagement we can have, the better. But just at the moment, as I said, uh, China's not interested in doing anything but shouting at people. Of course, they've also taken some of your citizens hostage uh, within China. Indeed, indeed. Um, there's a, a very well-known uh, Chinese-Australian uh, media personality who's just disappeared into the Chinese gulag and uh, it's just appalling, absolutely appalling what's happening. I wonder maybe Abe we could go to you for one final question. Sure. Well first deeply grateful for you mm -hmm. coming. Um, we've been, I've been wor working to support uh, the US-Australia Alliance for a long time. Um, and before the pandemic visited Australia about once a year. Mm -hmm. Sydney, Canberra, Perth I think is my favorite so far. Um, and uh, very grateful that you're here. You're welcome to, to come anytime. Um, the, um, other, the last piece I wanted to ask you about, we haven't really touched on Southeast Asia, mm -hmm. um, which I think, um, in my experience, um, friends in Australia are much more uh, sensitively tuned into the geopolitical dynamics of uh, Southeast Asia than most Americans. Um, I saw several of those uh, countries, especially our friends in Indonesia, expressing concern about the AUKUS agreement. Um, and yet, Southeast Asia is a key area of competition between the United States and China. Um, so I'd be curious your thoughts on how we can best engage Southeast Asia, be it individually, through ASEAN, um, and how you see Australia playing a role mm. in Southeast Asia. Yeah, look, uh, increasingly, the role of national leaders is, is not just to engage in a constant conversation with their own people, it's to engage in a pretty constant conversation with other national leaders. Uh, um, in my time as PM, I, I discovered that you spent an enormous amount of time uh, going to international meetings and Things have just intensified uh, since then, um, and and look, there will there will inevitably be issues that uh, give rise to concerns, and the only way to deal with that is as soon as any such issue arises uh, to get on the blower, uh, absolutely, and if possible, to get on a plane and have a face-to-face -face with, uh, with the relevant people. And look, uh, to Scott Morrison's credit, uh, I think he was very swiftly on the phone to um, the Indonesian president 
about the whole AUKUS thing to reassure him that this wasn't about nuclear weapons, it was just about uh, a nuclear power plant at sea. That's all it was. And, uh, and that this certainly uh, was not in any way directed uh, to the countries of ASEAN with whom we've got very good relations. So, so I think it's, it's just critical that uh, the dialogue be maintained at all times uh, with all of the relevant people. And I guess that gets us back to the point that Robert's just made. Yes, um, we do need to try to lower the temperature with China, but that requires the sort of dialogue that Xi Jinping just doesn't seem to be interested in at the moment. Thank you, Prime Minister Abbott. Thank you, Abe Denmark. Uh, and thanks to all of our audience members for tuning in and asking questions. Uh, the Wilson Center is going to continue to analyze developments in the Indo-Pacific and in U.S.-China relations, uh, and we hope that you'll join us for those discussions. Thank you.